Okay, it's uh, 10 o'clock. So Paul Vela, you, you want to introduce our speaker today? Sure. Hi, my name is Paul Vela, and I'm the uh, president of RMA. I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today for the Paul Brubaker State of Hawaii Economic Forecast webinar. Especially wanted to thank Paul for, for being here today to do the presentation. I think we're, we're in for a real treat. Paul Brubaker is the principal of TZ Economics, a Hawaii consultancy doing corporate work, development, impact analysis, and litigation support. His background is in research on the Hawaii economy, country risk, and financial risk analytics from 25 years working as a commercial bank economist. He received his AB from Stanford University and received his PhD from the University of Hawaii, both in economics. He also did graduate work at the University of Wisconsin, taught at his Madison and Milwaukee campuses, and lectured for many years at the University of Hawaii. He holds the Certified Business Economist designation from the National Association for Business Economics. Let's give a warm welcome for Paul. I'll hand it over to you, Paul. Aloha, RMA Hawaii chapter members and, and other hangers on. I will, I am record, recording the um, presentation, so we'll be able to provide a link to the, to the video uh, for those if, if you hear subsequently that somebody wasn't able to get in. And um, Paul, I'm gonna, and uh, maybe Grant, I'm, I'm not gonna pay attention to the questions or uh, what's in the chat, but um, if you want to uh, maybe keep track and then pick out the important ones towards the end of the hour, we can focus the Q and A on, on what you filter. And I'll go ahead and start with slides that I will also make available as a PDF to the RMA Hawaii chapter uh, later today. And then uh, your association uh, board can um, decide how to uh, make that accessible to meeting participants or members who couldn't uh, join us today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the Hawaii economic outlook as we work our way through the early part of the 2020s, kind of trying to, trying to find our way back, trying to find the economy's way back to the path we were on that it turns out Hawaii actually left um, before the pandemic, a couple of years, maybe three years, before the pandemic, Hawaii veered off course. And even before, you know, you can look at things like the Kilauea East Rift eruption beginning in May, 2018 as a displacement, at least for Big Island tourism, or the record rainfall and flooding on the island of Kauai in, uh, I think, April, 2018, as, you know, moments when an exogenous shock uh, displaced economic activity, at least, temporarily or over the summer or over the subsequent year or so, uh, in the case of Kauai, where the road had to be rebuilt. But um, it does seem to have emerged a little before that. And, and we didn't talk about it in the late 20 teens, or at least there wasn't much talk about it. Some of us who, you know, mentioned, hey, look, the unemployment rate's going up. That can't be good. Um, didn't seem to be able to generate any traction around some of those observations. Or the fact that, you know, we sort of ran out of, I don't know if you followed it, but we, in 2018, 2019, uh, constant dollar visitor expenditure for the first time in 30 years, got back to where it was in 1989. The all-time high is actually 30 years ago or 30 years pre-COVID, but um, never quite, you know, kind of almost got there in 2018 and then faded a little in 2019, slightly higher inflation. So in real terms, tourism receipts didn't quite get back to the record. And uh, and yet the conversation going on about tourism at that time was that we had over tourism. And I'm going, we don't have as much as we had in late 1980. So um, something happened pre-COVID and then COVID came and sort of this earth shattering uh, impact uh, disrupted everything. And we'll look a lot at what I like to think of as reverberation, right? Where you have a, you know, you have a, an earthquake and then aftershock. You have this kind of, or you see the in intraday, you know, uh, stock and uh, commodity prices where you have an information event like a 
a news release, you know, Elon Musk decides he doesn't want Twitter. And then you see prices overshoot. And then as they correct, they go into a kind of an oscillatory reverberate, reverberation, right? Boy, I, I, I. The real economy is doing some of that right now. So we'll take a look at all these things. Um, I have a couple of slides to set up here so I could remind myself we to talk about tourism. Or, I'm sorry, talk about COVID and its impact partly through tourism. Turn our attention to the labor market where a lot of a lot of mixed signals from which a lot of mixed signals are, are now emanating. And a lot of talk about this in the national labor market, you know, landscape, but we'll adapt and, and look at some of those same features in the Hawaii labor market. Uh, the margin on which remote work has affected the economy. And then of course, inflation, uh, monetary policy and, and where I think uh, the Hawaii economy is headed from now to maybe 2025. So, okay. the the pandemic's not over. So these subvariants, now we're talking about BA.5, and I think there's a BA.2.75 uh, that's coming out of India. Um, while less lethal or more infectious, and they've had an impact on the whole economy that again, nobody seems to want to talk about. Um, my analogy is that we've had three 9-11 events in the last year because of each of the last three COVID variants or sub-variant waves. So each time there's a variant wave, travel is suppressed, economic behavior uh, subsides or contracts, you know, people go into a more defensive mode. And, and so the economy is still being affected by these waves. The CDC says the BA5 is now dominant nationwide. This is through earlier this week. Uh, it displaced BA2, which was the variant that came out of the original Omicron wave last year winter, like December, January. So BA5 and maybe BA4, but BA5, way more infectious. And in terms of the Hawaii data, these are case counts, normalized cases per million residents. Um, we, it was actually higher this spring than last summer during Delta, but you know, everybody's partying and hey, I traveled, you know, although I, I traveled and then I hit out and then I came back and I was still hiding out. Um, BA5, if you look carefully at the Oahu data, it's starting, you know, the next wave, the BA5 wave. I don't know why people are all like, whoa, it's uncertain. No, yeah, the BA5 wave is coming, you guys. And it's going to unfold. It, it got a head start, got a jump start with a series of three-day weekends, Memorial Day, uh, King Kamehameha Day, uh, Juneteenth, uh, Fourth of July, like four three-day weekends in six weeks, you guys. Plenty of time for everybody to pass it around. The barbecue, and and now school's going to come back in a couple weeks with no masks. So get ready because it's it's on its way back. Now the case counts because of home testing. Um, we know that the case counts are probably higher. Dr. Char at Department of Health says multiply by five. Epidemiologists say maybe five or seven. You know, is the factor um, from measured test results to true uh, daily incidents, again, cases, new daily cases per million residents. And these are now weekly data, weekly averages of daily data that the state is publishing, has been publishing, right? Because COVID's over, so we're only gonna publish it weekly. Um, so that's what it would look like if it was the factor, you know, if it was 5X. And of course, we can see similar kinds of patterns now in the test positivity rates, which um, you know has subsided or the BA2 wave. Um, but, but again, I'm, I'm telling you, BA5 is coming, you guys. And uh, a little bit more concerned, the death rates are starting to creep up. Again, normalized per million residents, but we're headed for you know two people per million. And there's a million and a half people in Hawaii. So that's three persons per day, right? Three people per day are dying of COVID in Hawaii. And you know, if there was a mass shooting every day in Hawaii where three people died, people would be all over this. But instead, everybody's kind of like, yeah, whatever. They're old, it don't matter. So the link between cases and deaths, right? The transmission, so to speak, no pun intended, is complicated to gauge now that home testing has disrupted the quality 
of the testing results. But if you run these little, you know, vector autoregressions on the stationary component in three intervals, the delta interval, the Omicron interval, the, the, the subvariant uh, interval most recently in the lower right-hand corner, you can see the intensity, right, the transmission from cases to mortality uh, may be increasing. And, um, but because the test numbers are, let's say one fifth of the true number, then maybe that would dampen down. If I had like, if I put it, in fact, I should have done this. That's nice. Um, Might have dampened down. Um, anyway, cases show up and then two 14 day intervals later. So within a month, let's say, um, you have a statistically significant impact. So it's still going on and it's affecting the economy. So these are passenger counts, which we get daily. That was a 9-11, right? What a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So after 9-11, the governor asked a bunch of econ, econo nerds, right? Well, what should we do? And we said, DBED should grab the daily passenger counts and post them online. And they have since September 11th, 2001, DBED has been posting daily passenger counts. So you can go get, later today, you can go get this morning's or uh, yesterday's arrivals. But if there were more international visitors, you could get this morning's arrivals. And um, each of the last three waves has been associated with compression. You can see in the seasonally adjusted weekly transforms of the daily passenger counts, right? So Delta, uh, Omicron, BA1 variant, and then the subvariants. And the range of impacts is from about minus 20% to um, minus 8%. So in a normal year, right, in a normal tourism environment, if you said, oh, eight, you know, tourism is down 8%, well, that would be a recession. If you, said, you know, tourism is down 20%, that would be like a 9-11. But again, all I read about is how great tourism is doing. So that's, that's, that's the message, that's the official message, maybe because it's an election year. It's all good, don't worry about it. Um, and these are visitors, how about residents? Well, Google knows who your smartphone is and for how long. So if you look at mobility data, they, they track your GPS. So we know, they, you know, we know with anonymized mobility data, we know where Hawaii residents are for how long in say, in this particular instance, an index of retail uh, and recreation establishments, or it's listed two different ways, but it includes food, food service relative to the pre-COVID benchmark, January 2020. And each way in, in the early part of the pandemic, when there's a lot of uncertainty, you can see how much of a, you know, regression, so to speak, or contraction in retail establishment activity, right? People not going to the store as often. Um, but then more recently, let's say in the last year, since vaccination, if you will, uh, each of the Delta, Omicron, and the subvariant wave has had a similar impact. And the amount of time Hawaii residents spend in retail and food service and recreation establishments like gyms is about 20% below the pre-COVID benchmark. That's an interesting number. And that's looking semi-permanent. That looks like the new normal to me. So we'll, we'll, we'll look for that in some of the other data we'll be looking at. Here's another one. Uh, every time there's a, a variant wave, job postings are suppressed. Uh, these are data from Burning Glass. So there's an amazing amount of daily, right? These are daily data. Uh, I think these are weekly data, but there's an amazing amount of just a deluge of data, uh, anonymized metadata that um, all of these high tech companies made available as a public service uh, after, uh, after um, the initial sur pandemic surge in, in winter. Um, late winter 2020. And so we can use this to these data sets to corroborate some of what we see in conventional indicators, such as the ones we find in um, labor, you know, la uh, labor market um, activity or um, measurement um, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then for Hawaii, all of this now is published on DBED's website, the, the research it used to be over at Department of Labor and Industrial Relations has moved over, at least on the website. Uh, so everybody's in one house at DBAN and all the data. Uh, and so let's let's look at some of the, you know, some of the, the odd and possibly permanent 
post COVID impact. I'm sorry, I can't see the whole slide here because I got this bar on top of the screen. I don't know how to get rid of that. Reading in full. Um, all right. You heard about the jobs report na nationally last week. Here are jobs on the left side of the screen working their way back, right? You see the recovery trajectory. The news, the way the media posed it last week was that jobs as of June 2022 were now officially higher than they were just before COVID, which is a pointless benchmark, benchmark because before COVID, they were jobs are growing at 2%. So the true benchmark in terms of the labor market potential in America is where we would have been had the pandemic not happened. And that's this upper trajectory towards, what, towards which the nation is converging. Although there's a little curve, see that little bit of curvature there? Actually, this regression right here has a second order polynomial in it. So there's a little more curvature than you like curvature away from that pre-COVID path. And it may actually move to a parallel, parallel trajectory, which has to do with you know, the nature of the underlying, the, the underlying shock could have been severe enough that permanent structural changes did occur. So that's a possibility. Another possibility is that this slowdown in job growth on the right side of the screen, just the last beginning part of this year, I know everybody was impressed at, oh, 378,000 jobs or something. We only expected 278,000. So I can't, I can't remember what the numbers are, but something like that. There are 100, you know, Job growth was 100,000 jobs higher. Yeah, but compared to what it's been in this amazingly robust post-COVID recovery, and you, you can't count the initial part, but certainly by the second half of last year, this was you know sort of providing you with meaningful information. And now in the first half of this year, that slowdown uh, also is meaningful. And slowdown, by which I mean, we used to always create almost 200,000, I'm sorry, these are growth rates, we also almost always generate 2% job growth. I think this is like 1.8 something percent job growth. So that's, that's the steady state. That's, and the question now is if we have a recession, which we'll talk about later, you know, do we punch underneath that, right? You know, you know the definition of a recession, right? A recession is when you're unemployed and a depression is when I'm unemployed. So the Hawaii jobs data don't have the same growth um, uh, backdrop. As I say, sometime in 2017, uh, jobs on a log scale, right? Log scale, so slopes are growth rates, growth rates. So at some point, the 2%-ish growth that we saw in jobs nationwide um, was left in the rearview mirror in Hawaii in 2017 and jobs went flat and kind of stagnated. And I was I suggested earlier, that was a period where some of us were looking around going, why is the unemployment rate going up? And everybody else was kind of like, shut up, shut up. So then you have the COVID impact and then Hawaii working its way back. And, and here's kind of the feature I want to also draw attention to this, the fact that we've kind of gotten stalled out. Now, are those the variants? Maybe so. But jobs don't look like they're converging as robustly as they are nationwide, when you turn to the Hawaii data and when you break it down uh, between Oahu and the neighbor islands, the neighbor islands took a bigger hit during COVID because of their greater dependence on tourism. Uh, again, the pattern is similar, uh, some, you know, great recovery until the until last summer. Then some of the variants hit Delta Omicron, maybe that's all that is. But meanwhile, jobs today aren't that much higher than a year ago. and and well off like 90%, I've indexed this to the end of, or the middle of 2017. So we're still at like 90 something percent of where we were in 2017, five years ago, pre-COVID now. And predictably, if you consider where COVID's impacts were most severe in the travel complex and in you know customer facing uh, industries, um, and where there was more resilience, for example, in healthcare or government, and as it turned out, you know, relatively speaking, at least initially in construction, um, the job data for Hawaii by industry, and these are selected industries, make a lot of sense. Um, accommodation getting hit the hardest, along with transportation and the retail, you know, the part of retail that's focused on tourism. 
But again, this sort of phenomenon of stalling out at 90% or something uh, is, is showing up in those data as well. And if you look at a couple important ratios, labor force participation is stalling just slightly below its pre-COVID benchmark. Now, this has been declining since 19, the early 1990s because of aging and you know useless boomers and whatnot. Um, and that will probably continue to be on a declining trend going forward. But the participation rate may also be juiced a little bit because people have just left the workforce. Um, we'll look at that in a second. The employment to population ratio is a percentage point or two below the pre-COVID benchmark. That ought to be right up around 60%. And again, also has this look of stalling out at maybe 95% of its pre-COVID benchmark. The point I made about labor force participation was taken up in a paper last summer at the Jackson Hole meeting of the Fed that generated some interest among uh, you know, FOMC member types. And um, th I don't want to dwell on this, but it, it it's more complicated than needs to be. But uh, I took the methodology suggested and made a junk version. So this is like a local version where each of these swooshes in a kind of yellowish, whatever color this is, it represents from the moment unemployment was at its lowest point for the cycle, that these vertical lines, or the, right, the shaded lines, the shaded areas are U.S. recessions. And then prior to each recession, unemployment kind of hits its low point for the expansion. And if you measure labor force participation relative to trend from that point, from that moment forward, so the peak, so to speak, of the, of the employment cycle, if not the business cycle, right? The peak of the business cycle is at the start of each one of these recessions, like in December 2007, main uh, U.S. recession mainland or uh, U.S. recession. Hawaii sometimes is in, in its own private Idaho. But the low point for unemployment in Hawaii was two years early, you see what I mean? And then you look at participation relative to trend and you see that swoosh, that backwards Nike swoosh. Well, it turns out before the 1990s, before participation rates began turning, increasing female labor force participation, which was a dramatic change over the prior 30 years from 19, so the 1960s to the 1990s, right? In, in Hawaii, it went from like 40% of working age women to 70% um, of working age women. It's an amazing increase. Uh, higher participation among women than among men, I think, at some point in that, in that period. And then, and then aging boomers uh, demographics uh, took over. But in that 30 years before, the 1990s, we didn't see these swooshes, right? You can see it was there was a kind of a U-shaped formation right before the end of the employment uh, expansion, but uh, it was either flat or uh, actually upward. If you go back in time and look at, I don't have good data before 1976. I have my own data, but it's not good. Um, what people are talking about now is this lag in the labor force participation response to economic recovery. And it just we just don't know, but we could be going through one of those things right now uh, as well. So you didn't care, but there's an interesting paper saying that, you know, maybe one of the, there's several reasons why the labor market is messed up. And part of the reason is that not just because of COVID, but because in general, people tend to defer their re-entry into the labor market after one of these big events like the recession. Now, you're familiar with our unemployment rate coming back to about 4%. Um, there are multiple measures, which Republicans love because that gives them a higher number than the one the Democrats like, but whatever. The U3 unemployment rate is 4% in Hawaii. And if you look at the rate at which the unemployment rate is changing relative to its low point in the prior 12 months, let me say that again, if you look at where a moving average, three month moving average of the unemployment rate is relative to its pr relative to the previous year. You get a little indicator or sometime indicator of incipient recession. Um, so, for example, in the Paul Volcker monetary policy, you know, high inflation, cold turkey recession, 
era of the you know the Reaganomics era of the early 1980s, Hawaii clearly was signaling its participation in the in the second of the double dip recessions, although not so much the first. And then you know the the Hawaii becalmed period, where Hawaii was its own private Idaho, like I said earlier, it had an, a decade long period of stagnation while the rest of the economy is going through the dot com boom. Well, that was presaged by a series of increases in this what's called the the, the SOM rule, the SOM ratio. Um, it, it went up after the Japan bubble burst, signaling that Hawaii was going to have a recession. But then Hurricane Iniki came and put all the construction workers back to work on Hawaii. Uh, and then here's another, remember thumbs up, those of you who are old enough, like it was, Hawaii was, you know, this index was indicating Hawaii was in for just a complete economic beatdown. And our response was a marketing campaign. Think positive. Um, but you can see that uh, before the 2008 recession, this ratio was signaling uh, uh, incipient recession and actually started to improve until Oahu Airlines shut down. Um, a little bit of this in the late 19, uh, late 20 teens, right? I mentioned around or just before the volcanic eruption in spring of 2018, there were warning signs that we should have been paying attention to, but technically it didn't reach this 0.5 threshold, the ratio of the three month moving average of the recent unemployment rate to the 12 months at, uh, the low point. Uh, the minimum uh, uh, over the previous 12 months. And right now, to make a short story long, right now, it is not signaling recession for Hawaii at all yet. But okay, so that's good. Um, more anomalies, the number of job openings in Hawaii relative to the unemployment rate is at an historic high. Yeah, you usually, basically there's two jobs open for every unemployed person like that never happened but it has ever since the pandemic and quits are higher than they've ever been in hawaii these are hawaii data so it used to be you know and you know maybe two percent or like an upper bound of two percent of workers would leave their jobs in the late again after 2017 that started to creep up like pre-covid now people were saying hey take this job brother and now it's moving even higher. I mean, it's, you know, it's headed to like two or three percent. For a while last year, Hawaii had the highest quit rates in the country. So th again, there's some weird things going on. It's a tight labor market, but it's tight because people are quitting. They're not participating, right? They're not. There's plenty of jobs, but they're not grabbing them. And if you've been paying attention to the demographic data, they're just bailing. They're just straight up leaving Hawaii. So we won't have time to spend too much time talking about that, but it does, we'll conclude with a reference to it again. And then finally, one of these mobility indices, you can see relative to the pre-COVID benchmark relative to January, 2020, how much time people or their smartphones spend at home or in conventional workplaces. So either because of remote work or hybrid work, people are spending 30 to 40% less time at work. And then there's some you know, there's 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 a cycle here. Each variant, right? You can see the holidays. There's Christmas, July Fourth, Thanksgiving, Christmas. So on July Fourth, this is last weekend. Last weekend, last week, I can't remember. July Fourth, people went home. You know, were at home more than they were at work on Monday. But um, or or over the weekend. These are daily data, and uh, and there you see the sub variant impact but the point more generally is that this looks like a new normal maybe 30 percent less time spent in workplaces on average as i say because of combination of remote work and and uh hybrid now pre-covid these are the pre-covid u.s data only 10 percent of people ever worked from home and of that 10 percentage points only three or four worked from home full time so you know before covid we called it shirking from home not working from home but as soon as COVID came, these are Google searches on, right? Have you ever used Google Trends? You go put in a search plan like Hawaii vacation or, you know, my boss sucks or whatever and see how many searches there are uh, on Google. And uh, so these are Google searches for the phrase, um, what is it, working from home. 
And uh, you, not only was there an increase after COVID, it's it's permanently stayed higher. It's like right the peak is 100, so it's it's maybe two times or three times as high permanently as it was pre-COVID. Uh, so people continue actively to look into this. Obviously, COVID itself created a necessity for many people to work at home. And But in addition to the 10% of workers who worked at home at least sometime pre-COVID, currently there's an additional, let's call it 8%, right? The, the, the total is right now 8% with the following pattern. Persons with higher educational attainment are more likely to work from home. Women are more likely to work from home than men. Millennials are more likely to work from home than boomers. And again, this is in addition to the original 10% of workers. The patterns across industries are about what you'd expect. Finance insurance that I asked earlier about, you know, financial types, professional services, uh, industries, information industries, public administration uh, tends to have higher uh, this is May, I think, the spring. These are spring of this year data, as opposed to accommodation, agriculture, construction, where you need to be on the job site. Makes sense. If you look at working from home by occupation, right? This is industry. These are occupational data, right? The math nerds rule. Lawyers work from home now, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you're working in farming or food preparation or construction and mining, you've got to be on the job site. Um, Hawaii data, these, these are all national data, but now I have a little bit of Hawaii data. So just to cut to the chase here, the census conducts a, a survey, they keep changing the questions. And so I've tried to map consistently from actually three different questions. A year ago, they literally were asking, so between spring break and 4th of July last year, they were asking in the surveys, what percentage of adults are living in households where at least one adult has telework because of the pandemic? And the answer was, 20%, you see that? Spring of 2021. So 20% of adults in Hawaii a year ago in the spring were living in households where at least one adult was working from home. And then they changed the question. So it's the inverse. The question today asked, what percentage of adults live in households where somebody worked on site at a workplace in the last week? And the answer is two thirds, two thirds of adults in Hawaii work in households in the last week where somebody worked on site at a workplace, which implies that one third did not, right? This there, one third, 33%. Well, what's in that 33%? It's old buggers that are retired. My brother who makes money, I don't know how, he used to work for SpaceX, but not at SpaceX, he just had a laptop. So, okay, guys like that. Um, and then, you know, so again, maybe another 20%. If you take out the retired people and the people we just don't know what the hell they're doing, uh, maybe another 20%. The, the 20% number keeps coming up. People who are engaged in telework in some form or another, maybe double what it was pre-pandemic. A structural change, a one-time like L-shaped change that's now settling into a new normal. And according to the guys who run, guy who runs the BLS, we're not going back to the old normal. This is it, you guys. So if you got vacant space in your office building or in the strip mall, it's time to start thinking about redeploying the productive capacity. Let me just point to one impact on one of the margins in which we're seeing effects of this. And there, there's still a debate about this. So Nick Bloom at Stanford uh, wrote a paper about the so-called donut effect where because people didn't have to live in proximity to their places of employment, they're moving further out and they can work remotely so they can live further away from their conventional workplaces, the, the so-called donut effect. And then Ed Glazer, who's um, at Harvard um, and a you know, big champion of the of agglomeration externalities and the role of cities and productivity growth and whatnot over the last centuries, if not millennia, um, points out that when, when let's say people move out of their condo in Kakako or, or Capital Place downtown or Chinatown because they don't have to actually get to the office downtown anymore or as often, right? They can move out to the burbs, you move out to a ridge in Hawaii Kai or out to the North Shore or to Zoom towns like Hanapepe, 
Well, when um, people move out of the urban core, then that makes their relative prices more attractive, right? Urban core housing may not, prices may not fall, but relatively speaking, there's a different kind of a demand shock at work. And so there's going there should, you should expect a backwash. If the initial wave is moving outward, the donut effect, you should expect a backwash and we're seeing some of that unfold. Um, even here in Honolulu, right? The millennials want to be closer to the, you know, the, I don't know, the club. They want to they want to walk home from right or they don't want the uber ride to be so long uh from partying uh, a recently published uh paper uh suggests that about a quarter up to a quarter of home price appreciation um i'm sorry up to one half of uh home price appreciation in the last year or two is coming from this remote work phenomenon so let's just take a little bit of a glance at the hawaii data so I, I, I got all the data from the Board of Realtors. Mahalo's to those guys. I can't remember her name, but she, awesome. Appreciate it. Um, that was her name. She's new. Anyway, she's great. Um, and uh, so I can calculate the uh, empirical uh, frequency distributions um, or the extent to which they approximate a gamma distribution. Um, for condos on the left side of the screen, for, Oahu, for single family homes on the right side, this is all, all Oahu data, in three different 12 month periods, right? The 12 months ending in March, 2020, so pre-COVID, the 12 months ending in March, 2021, so the pre-vaccine year, and then the 12 months ending in March of this year. So the year in which people supposedly got vaxxed, boosted, and, You'll, now that you've looked at it for a while, you can see that single family home prices busted a much bigger move. You see that than condo prices did in the same, you know, in the comparable period. Like even in year one, you can see that condo prices didn't hardly change at all, right? If you think about the median, right? A measure of central tendency, like the mean or the median, Right, the mo the modes didn't change at first, and then they right the peak of each distribution didn't change that much at first, and then totally busted a move on the single family side. Well, we see that in the neighborhood data. So, particularly for 2020, you can see that the neighborhoods with the highest single family home price appreciation. Right, you, if you look for the donut effect, you should look for North Shore, Waikai, you know, the Highlands, Makakilo, Mililani, Windward Oahu. And it's exactly where it showed up. And you should see prices in town decreasing, which is exactly what happened. Now that that became more diffuse in 2021. So well, one time shock. People pimped out a home office and, and moved to the burbs. And you see it in the dynamics of single family and condo prices, which I've illustrated in parallel here. I got the scales correct, so I'm not cheating. Uh, I got them proportionate, so I'm not cheating. But again, these are logs, so slopes are percent changes. And condos were right. These are trends from the 20 teens. Condos were rising at a 5% as opposed to 4% rate for single family homes. That's partly an affordability story. Partly condos rising from a deeper trough in the post subprime bubble uh, period. So rising a little faster from a deeper uh, post COVID, I mean, post, uh, post financial crisis. Uh, trough, but I get, but but here's the smoking gun right here. This surge in single family home prices outside the 95, 99% confidence interval, two, two standard errors. Uh, and, and the curvature suggesting it's gonna converge, I mean, suggesting to me, it's gonna, it's gonna converge on a parallel path. So yeah, people freaked out when prices went over a million dollars, single family prices on Oahu last summer, but dude, if you just waited like another year, it was going to be over 1 million anyway. It just busted a move faster because of the post COVID donut effect. And then on the condo side, you can see condos catching up, but only recently converging to the pre COVID trend. Why? Because in the late 20, here's this late 20 teens stagnation. Something happened after 2017 that nobody wanted to talk about because it's all good, where prices went flat in 2018 and 2019. And basically, if you look at single family home prices statewide in the four counties, you see the same bust a move, see the same curvature. Here's the, the curvature here on the Big Island 
because it's there's, there's too much noise here. But it happened on Maui. It happened on Hawaii as well. Okay, so that's a fact, Jack. And and again, see that stagnation in the late in 2019 ish. What was that all about? Eh. Um, which brings us then to inflation because we got to talk about it because the newspaper said so. And a um, couple things. Okay, U.S. is having a problem, but then so is U.K. So it can't be U.S. fiscal policy alone. It's the pandemic, stupid. Um, but Hawaii is not having as much of a problem. So let's decompose that a little bit here. In the first place, Hawaii's inflation, uh, we only have a May number, but next month we'll get July. I'm pretty sure it'll be about seven, about the same as it was in May. That is, it's no longer going up. Inflation recently in Hawaii is only slightly above where it was in the last cycle and not as high as it was before Persian Gulf War or at the time of the Persian Gulf War and nowhere near the benchmark that everybody's talking about, right? The highest in 40 years. Well, except for the, it's only 30 years in Hawaii, meaning it was actually higher 30 years ago. But more importantly, look at the profile of inflation here. That looks more like world war or demobilization from war. You see what I mean? It's not the end of a 10 to 15 year crescendo of rising inflation that we associate with the, the great inflation of the late 1960s and 1970s that had to be thwarted by Paul Volcker writing on his white charger, right? It's, it's not the 80s, the Japan bubble, it's not the subprime bubble of the early 2000s where inflation went from this Hawaii be calmed stagnation in the late 1990s while everybody else enjoyed the dot-com boom to the pre-Great Recession uh, peak, uh, just to, you know, not quite 7% uh, inflation that we've had in just the last year. Like literally since, right, there's May of last year and here's May of this year for the Hawaii data. The US number just came out for July, it's 9%. And yeah, the US looks like it has more problems and that's why the Fed's responding. But in Hawaii, it looks like, I think, you're close to the end of it, you guys. And clearly, if it just happened in one year, it's and not at the end of you know a decade of ratcheting up inflationary expectations. It's got to be not just aggregate demand factors at work. It's got to have. It's got to reflect an aggregate supply shock. Now, in terms of the aggregate demand shocks, the fiscal stimuli after COVID, right, came in the CARES Act, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of December 2020, and then Biden's ARPA in March 2021, five trillion in fiscal stimulus. And it turns out we probably only needed four trillion to keep the economy from evaporating. Um, and that's a view, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, always like Ken Raga, Ken Raga, who moved into my office, you guys. <laughs> I like this guy. Ken Rogoff has been making this argument. You know, the problem, you, you know, ex post, what the correct amount dose, right? What the correct dose of fiscal stimulus should have been. But at the time, in the middle of the crisis, you don't know. So you can't underdose the patient or the patient might die. So I, that's the logic anyway. So now we know that five trillion was too much, probably should have been less than five. And as soon as ARPA dropped, People went off and started buying stupid stuff. Like, I don't know what they were buying, but there was not enough of it being produced because of the um, because of the pandemic. And when you separate the headline from the core inflation rate for Honolulu, you can see that of the seven percentage points, four of the seven are sort of aggregate demand shock. They're in the core, right? They're for people who don't eat or drive, right? The inflation rate, less food and energy. 4%, whereas once you include these supply shock prone line items in the CPI, it's an additional three percentage points of inflation in Hawaii is coming from the global supply chain disruption, the supply shock, right? So, right, do here, draw the picture, as Mr. Sakamoto used to say in my 10th grade geometry class at Kailo High School, DTP, he would draw up on the chalkboard. DTP, draw the picture, right? So aggregate demand, I don't know which direction, is this aggregate demand for you? Aggregate demand goes up, 
aggregate supply contracts, what happens? Unambiguous, I mean, ambiguous impact on output, demand, supply, but unambiguous impact on the aggregate price level, unambiguously higher aggregate prices when a fiscal stimulus and a supply shock are going on at the same time. Now, we'll look at the unwinding of the supply shock in a second, but meanwhile, when you drill down to the urban Hawaii consumer price index inflation components, and it's the urban Hawaii CPI, it's no longer the Honolulu CPI, because Maui is a city. <laughs> so the, right, the, the, the Kahului, Wailuku, Lahaina metropolitan statistical area is now included with urban Honolulu, as opposed to regular Honolulu. Anyway, urban Honolulu and Kahului, Wailuku, Lahaina, MSA are combined in the urban Hawaii consumer price index for all urban consumers. And the components pulling the inflation rate up are exactly the ones you'd expect. Motor fuels, liquid fuels generally, utilities, and then because of the semiconductor shortage, used vehicles and new vehicles, and then the supply shock showing up in food as well. So it's all that stuff above average. Now the average 7%, there are other things inflating, although not so much housing, right? Because the prices that went up with the prices of the 5% of the houses that actually transacted, 5% of the housing inventory in any given year on average, and but the other 95%, you just lived in your house. You didn't. It, the mark to market went up. Maybe you leveraged and refied your mortgage with the you know uh, new appraisal. But the point is that the right it's, it's not costing. In fact, it costs you less because you just refied. Uh, by the way, that ship has sailed. So um, yeah, the mix of demand and supply effects. Why semiconductors? Because you pimped out a home office. You bought your kid a Chromebook so she could go to school remotely. Right. The whole planet did that. And all the chips went over to devices uh, and weren't available for autos, which nobody was buying at first anyway. I mean, you know, rental car companies were dumping their fleets. So when you look across all of these commodities, like with oil, where it's, I can't keep up updating it. It's come back. By the way, oil has just gone back to where it was 10 years ago. So stop having a cow. But uh, it's come back to $100 from $120. Um, corn, another one of these. Again, you can't, I can't keep up with this stuff. So this is, you know, corn went to seven dollars, eight dollars a bushel, and is backtracking. And I downloaded it this morning, and it's six dollars a bushel. So a lot of right, the the corn commodities prices map into producer prices, which now are starting to level out. Um, construction materials have been a big problem because, as I say, I, I I joke about it, but everybody pimped out a home office. That's actually what happened the day the sawmill shut down. Everybody decided to renovate their house so they can make a workspace and so on the, uh, the entire planet. So construction materials, producer prices, uh, you know, launched 50% in a very short period. That's got to hurt. Um, but now if you look at lumber, say the mapping from lumber prices to the PPI for lumber, you can see that the, when I did this graph a month ago, the lumber prices were trending down. And just this morning, I just pulled all the commodity data. So that's how current you need to be these days. But in the period since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is late February, yeah, a lot of these, there's Brent crude come back to where it was pre-invasion, um, CBO, uh, Chicago Board of Trade, wheat, you know, back to $8 a bushel. A lot of this, the lumber I just mentioned has gotten back a year ago. Uh, levels now a year ago they were still high relative to pre-covid but i'm just saying there's you know there's not as much craziness and this volatility see that double peak triple peak that volatility it's not going away we just saw this in the covid and tourism data uh copper suggesting independently that we may be headed for recession so okay i need to wrap up you all know this you follow this at work the yield curve is flattened um the two to 10 spread uh, has gone negative. And you can see that that doesn't always presage a, a recession. And indeed in 1974, this is probably the best benchmark for a soft landing. The moment the Fed went to 75 basis point Fed funds rate increases at the end of 1994, um, you know, the treasury yield curve 
uh, signal, watch out. And, um, and uh, you know, the Fed managed to land the economy without a crash and burn. Um, in the pre and uh, subprime bubble period, when uh, Greenspan was raising Fed funds targets deliberately at 25 basis points per meeting, right at a measured pace, um, we stayed in that zone for quite a while. And that's an important point. In a world with zero inflation risk premium, like if in a world where people actually believe the Fed, that the Fed's commitment to 2% average inflation target on the core person with assumption expenditure later is credible, so there's no inflation risk, the yield curve should be flat. There should be no reason to ward, be rewarded for parting with your money for 10 years as opposed to two years. And that's kind of what we had pre-Great Recession. In fact, we had, as, as you see here, an extensively uh, an extended inversion, which did eventually lead to recession, but it led to a recession because something, you know, something hit the fan. Um, like, like um, CDO squareds on subprime, uh, you know, uh, M MBS or credit default swaps, blah, 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 blah. And right now the vulnerability is coming from um, the persistence of COVID. But meanwhile, the Fed, because it's given us its targets, it's given us its projections and it it uses forward guidance much more aggressive. Back here where the Fed was really made, they, you know, back in 1970, 94, they didn't tell us anything. And then in measure pace, they just confirmed that they were moving at the same pace as, you know, for two straight years as they did at their previous meetings. Now the Fed's trying to front load it and hence that overshoot in their own expectations of the Fed funds rate. Um, they're unwinding their balance sheet and inflation expectations, uh, notwithstanding the fact that they, they had crept into the range of, you know, two and a half to 3% are working their way back down. There's an inversion in the term structure of inflation expectations. So people expect higher inflation in five years, over five years than over a 30 year horizon. But generally speaking, inflation expectations remain well anchored. Now, the higher interest rates are having gonna have an impact on Hawaii. So higher, higher mortgage rates are associated with lower sales. The, the caveat being that, right, if you, you actually connect the dots here in these data, you run the regression over here and you pass through your course. But then in the actual dynamics, right, it's a clockwise, see the clockwise pattern. So we're probably headed for a hard right turn now with sales dropping at the new higher mortgage rates. We saw that back in 2008, okay. And uh, these crazy, I mean, the yen's trading at 138 yen per dollar and the euros at parity at one euro, one dollar per euro. Now we don't have good data from the European travelers, There's not that many of them. We have great data for Japan travel. As you think about Japanese coming back to Hawaii, at 130 or 140 yen per dollar, they do not spend nearly as much, $200 a day, as they do at 85 yen per dollar, where they spend $300 a day. That I means mean, straightforward math. So both in terms of the direct channel of interest rates, rising interest rates, lowering investment, and the secondary channel of a higher uh, interest rate on US dollar denominated securities and therefore uh, a stronger dollar uh, impairing tourist um, expenditure. Um, you know, we've got some headwinds. So this may be the soft landing. This is not the mainland, like the bumper sticker says, bumper sticker says, right? This is not the mainland. But um, you know, there's an inflation thing, and the supply side should burn itself off. The supply shock, and then the um, you know the Fed's going to deal with the. I'm not really worried about that. And uh, what, what people thought was bubblicious in the housing market over the last couple of years is probably just the the you know the um, shirking from home. Um, returning and concluding now with some longer term observations, although this is short term. So these are daily passenger counts relative to um, the 2019 benchmark and TSA daily throughput. Again, right relative to um, 2000 pre-COVID 
uh, benchmark. So you can see Hawaii's travel experience not that much different from the mainland. You can, again, there's Delta, there's Omicron, the subvariants. But this problem of being stuck at about 90%, I think that's something we need to think about as we approach the election, for example, uh, this year. Tourism, to go back, uh, if you, I, I looked at passenger counts, but these are monthly visitor counts and visitor days. And I've constructed June and July estimates based on the passenger counts that you do have. The passenger counts I know, and I construct estimates, projections of visitor days and vis uh, visitor arrivals. So again, falling short of the trend we were on, kind of stuck in a, you know, we're almost there. And then we're just getting whacked over and over by variants and subvariants. Visitor expenditure in constant dollars trying to work its way back to that 2018, 2019 moment, which as it turns out, was just shy of where things were back in 1989. So we're still trying to get back to where we were in terms of tourism exports, right? Constant dollar tourism exports. And um, uh, as a specific example in tourism, revenue per available room um, has worked its way back to the trend, but is, you know, again, facing some challenges and I think facing some um, significant volatility to the extent these COVID waves continue to evolve and unfold. In the long run, productivity output per capita has grown at about 2% since the Industrial Revolution. This amazing data set put together by some economic historians. So when you look at that 2% path for US GDP cap per capita and compared to Hawaii, you can see Kauai's golden age was the late territorial, early statehood, right? Go for, go for broke period in economic growth. And then we began throttling the Hawaii economy more recently. And the pandemic has been kind of a death blow in the sense that we took a big beat down and, in Hawaii and then our recovery is just not it's, not, it's not there, you guys. We're still, 10 to 15 percentage points below where we would have been had the trend in you in Hawaii GDP through the middle of 2017 had that persisted as it did nationwide. Um, so uh, there are some structural problems. And meanwhile, US GDP was negative. GDP growth in real terms was negative in the first quarter. And the now casts for second quarter suggest it's going to be non positive in the second quarter. So we've got this weird. Got a tight labor market with job growth, but GDP output may actually be declining in the US or just not increasing. So maybe a growth recession, the risk being that it could turn into a recession. Um, you know, I think soft landing is still feasible, but we have bigger problems in Hawaii. And we began drifting away from our potential pre COVID. And now people are canceling, just, you know, canceling telescopes, canceling vacation rentals. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. Canceled, we canceled biotech in the state from which a woman who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for inventing CRISPR-Cas9 technology, right? Gene editing technology. That's why Haney grew up in Hilo, you guys. I want you to cancel biotech. So I, I don't know, you, you tell me what's going on because if you look at the demographic data and I'll skip over it because it's all gonna be revised when the decennial census enumerations drop next year. But if 60,000 people left Oahu in the last five years, how can we still have a housing crisis at three persons per unit? I mean, I, people are talking about a completely different world out there from the one I'm seeing in the data about which I have concern. Recovery for sure, but maybe not back to our potential. And I mean, right, you don't wanna be Nothing against Detroit, but they had a bad spell, the whole Rust Belt. And Hawaii could be headed for um, its own version of that if it keeps throttling the way people think we want to. I've run out of the hour. I'm going to stop now. I'll cut off the recording here, but I'll be happy to uh, stay on for q and I know some of you have real jobs and want to get back to work. Um, so when I edit the video, I'll either chop off or include a couple of questions. But if you got to go, I understand it's 11 o'clock. Mahalo for your time. And uh, I'm going to stick around. So those of you leaving, see you next time.